In the vast tapestry of existence, humanity has pondered the question that transcends time and space. What is the meaning of life? Countless philosophers, theologians, and thinkers have sought to unravel this enigma, exploring the depths of human experience and the cosmos. What is the meaning of life? This question rocks the mind of man in a way that almost no other question does. Why does man exist? Why am I here? What am I living for? Who made me? These questions and more, every man comes to a point in his life where he asks them and in asking them, he searches for truth. But in searching for truth, can he find the answers? Can man surely and definitively find why he exists on this earth and to what purpose his life can give? Or is he forever lost in the mystery that is the meaning of life? In the vastness of the universe, do we find purpose in our existence or are we adrift in an indifferent cosmos? Amidst the wonders of nature and the intricate balance of ecosystems, is the meaning of life a reflection of a purposeful design by a great and almighty creator? Or is it shaped by the randomness of time and chance? In the pursuit of knowledge and understanding, does life gain meaning through the accumulation of wisdom? Or is our existence confined to the limits of human comprehension? Facing the moral complexities of our choices, is the existence of life found in the pursuit of virtue and ethical conduct? Or is morality a subjective construct of human societies? Is life's purpose connected to a higher power or a divine plan? Or does spirituality offer a personal journey of self-discovery and reflection? Do we find meaning in the moments of joy and sorrow? Or does life's significance extend beyond the temporalness to a timeless context? Considering the interplay of free will and destiny, is life's meaning shaped by our choices and actions, or are we bound to a predetermined script? Gazing into the vast unknown, pondering the mysteries of existence, can we ever truly grasp the ultimate meaning of life? Or is it a perpetual question that guides us on an eternal journey of exploration and self-discovery? I believe that man can know the truth. I believe that man can love the truth. I believe that man can serve the truth. Man was made to know, love, and serve. But in order to live a life that is worth living, man must know the reason for his existence. Howdy y'all, my name is Nicholas Cavazos. I'm a 25 year old convert to the Catholic Church as well as a Catholic podcast host. I love what I do. I love the work that I get to do with my friends, talking about issues of the Catholic faith to audiences around the world. However, I find myself as I get older, 
asking myself the hard questions of life, questions along the nature of why am I on this earth? As I continue to look at my life thus far, a quarter of a century in, I see myself as someone who is blessed. I grew up in a small town amidst beautiful fields and flowing streams, but yet I find my heart craving something more, to know more about why am I on this earth, to love others better, to serve others better. I find myself reflecting and examining my conscience and saying, am I a good man? Am I a man that is worthy of the title of Christian? Am I a man that is truly marked by the love of Jesus Christ? I had recognized that I am a man who falls incredibly short of this. But yet at the same time, I see the grace of Christ is transformative. The grace of Christ is greater than my sin. The greatest desire of my heart has always been to know God and to make him known to the world. However, how many of us truly know God? How many of us just know things about God rather than coming into an encounter with the true and living God? The same God that was incarnate in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the same God that performed miracles on this earth, that healed the sick, raised the dead, opened the eyes of the blind, and suffered and died for you and for me. And by the power of his Father rose again on the third day according to the scripture, proving to the world that he is God. The reason for our existence is Jesus Christ. He is whom we owe our very breath in our very life. However, how many of us truly know God? How many of us truly know God? I wanted to take this question seriously. In order to do this, I wanted to put myself into a spiritual incubator, into a place in which I knew I could seek God and his holy truth in an undisturbed fashion. To do this, I put myself into an experiment. I decided to live in a traditional Catholic Benedictine monastery for 30 days and for 30 nights. While being at this monastery, I decided to read over the great Catholic theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas' magnum opus, the Summa Theologiae, or the Summary of Theology. From cover to cover, so that I could finally and holistically understand the Catholic religion. I want to take you on this journey with me. I want to bring you with me into the cloister, into the cells of the monks, into the realm of contemplation, onto the iron couch of introspection. And I want you to see with me the beauty and truth of the Catholic faith. My hope and prayer for this documentary, that you will be motivated to look at yourself and say, do I know God and am I willing to give up everything for him? So follow me now into the very heart of the monastery Follow me as we examine the deep questions of life and finally and definitively answer the question, what is the meaning of our own existence?
Clear Creek Abbey, nestled in the Ozark Mountains of eastern Oklahoma, is a community of 60 traditional Benedictine monks. Sons of St. Benedict, the monks spend their lives following the motto, Ora et Labora, Work and Pray. These sons of St. Benedict are spiritual sons of the Congregation of Salem, a French congregation nestled in southern France. Our Lady of Fongambo Abbey experienced a revival in the 1970s and 80s, while many other Catholic religious communities were on the decline. A group of young American students from KU University went to Our Lady of Fongenbo Abbey under the advisement of then Dr. John Sr., a professor at KU and a great Catholic philosopher. These young students went to France and ended up spending a whole winter with the monks. Their experience was so profound that they ended up becoming sons of St. Benedict, Benedictine monks, and serving there for many years. However, as time went on, they longed for a return to their homeland in the United States. They longed to found a congregation according to the traditional Benedictine practices and live out their monastic vows and in community with one another in the heartland of America. Finding their prayers answered, the monks in the late 90s came to Oklahoma in the United States, where since the late 1990s, they have been building a community that has been flourishing and attracting the attention of many holy and pious souls who desire the simplicity and richness of the traditional Catholic life, as well as the traditional monastic observances and office. This place I knew would be a wonderful place to try out my experiment. I've already been to this abbey many times before for very short stays one to two days, three days, four days, but a month? I had never done a month. What was I going to find by living here for one month? What kind of person would I be walking out of this place after a month with Aquinas? Would I go stark raving mad? Would I be a spiritual genius? Or would I be a broken beggar? So the drive is approximately eight hours to the monastery from my current location, which isn't too bad because coming from Texas, really driving anywhere is going to be at least <laughs> at least a couple hours. Um, but the feeling I'm feeling right now, recognizing, you know, being away from the family for 30 days, being away from the, you know, the cat and the dog, and I guess normalcy is most people experience it. Um, it's definitely an interesting feeling because it's like on the one hand, uh, you know, you, I know I'll miss my family and I'll miss all everybody, family, friends. Um, but uh, at the same time, it's kind of like, what's going to be on the other side of this attempt? What's going to be at the other side of this read? What's going to be at the, on the other side of spending 30 days in a monastic setting? You know, what effect will that have on me? What effect will that have on people in a general sense? 
you know, um, especially when so much of this is going to be unplugged from media, unplugged from the internet. Um, you know, sometimes people go through and they'll talk about, you know, they've experienced kind of a, um, a media detox where, you know, they'll be away from media for like maybe a couple of days or for a week or something like that. And they'll talk about the effects that that has, you know, there's a certain brain clarity that comes from it. There's a certain mental function that's enhanced by being away from these things. But I'm kind of wondering what's it going to be like after 30 days, you know, just a period. <clears throat> what will that experience be like? What will that mental clarity be like if there is any, you know, what, what, what will this be like? And so it should be interesting, I think, to say the least, because you know, it is a little bit of an experiment to see what's going to happen. So I guess we'll find out that at the end of the day. I just got done with the morning show. Just said goodbye to Tim and Jeremiah and Fowler and everybody. And so, uh, yeah, it's a little bittersweet saying goodbye to the homies for a whole month. But uh, I definitely know that. When I see them again, it's going to be a, a joyous occasion. So, yeah, it's been interesting as I've been kind of thinking and processing through um, being gone from a, for a month and being at a monastic setting. And I've been, as I've been telling people these things, sometimes they're like, oh, you know, are you really sure you can do that? You know, be kind of away from the world, if you will, for 30 days and... Um, you know, it's interesting, there's like a part of me that wonders, you know, can I do that? I'm not entirely sure. Is this something I could do? Is this something I, w I won't be able to accomplish? I don't know. Um, but I do know that I'm the type of individual that wants to get stuff done and likes to accomplish things, uh, even great, great feats. I don't know if you would quote call this a great feat, but it is definitely gonna be something that's going to come out, I think, with a lot of fruit. So, with that being said, I think it's important that I pack. So let's get packing.
as I pulled up to the monastery, the sense of enclosement came upon me in a very powerful way. The monks kindly showed me to my room, which initially was in the old monastery, that is the initial uh, foundational building that the monks built when they came to Oklahoma, which was at one time a horse stable, but had later on been converted into monastic cells, and then further on from that converted into guest lodging. As the night started to close, the feeling of peace and silence filled the air that was around me, and I could feel my own heart starting to calm as the tensions of the secular world were ebbing away, and the quietness of contemplation was starting to dawn. The monastic stay starts at around 4.30 in the morning when the monks hear the bell that awakens them to prayer. The monks, following the ancient Christian custom based in Holy Scripture, pray approximately eight times throughout the day once at night, what is known as the office of Matins, and seven times throughout the day. In the monastic office, the monks chant the Psalms from the Psalter of David. Every single week, traditional monks chant all 150 Psalms. I knew that Participating in this chant, as well as in the traditional Latin Mass that the monks celebrate, was going to be vital for my own spiritual journey and my own contemplation that I was going to be undertaking at this time. And so I rose at the bell and with the monks went to the office of Martins, followed then by the office of Louds, and then Low Mass. But before I knew it, it was already time to begin my reading. So I got volume one ready to go. Man, it is bright outside. I got volume one ready to go. We're going to uh, sit down now and begin reading. It's a little daunting, not going to lie. It's 100 pages per day, as I've been talking about. But um, I think it's going to be very beneficial. Because when we counterbalance study with prayer and the liturgy and all the different devotions, it's going to have a good effect. It's going to be impactful, more or less what I'm saying. Aquinas begins his Summa by exploring the existence and nature of God. He contemplates the famous five ways, which are five arguments that seek to demonstrate the existence of God through reason and observation of the natural world. The five ways beckon us to ponder the origin and order of the universe, urging us to ask profound questions about our existence. How did everything come into motion? What causes the chain of events in our world? Why does anything exist at all? This morning was like a really interesting feeling. I think whenever someone attempts something to this degree, uh, there's a bunch of questions that kind of go through their mind. You know, can you do this? Can you not do this? Especially in this context where, you know, the task is to read 100 pages a day for 30 days straight. Can one do this? Can not one do this? For me, I kind of have somewhat of a joking attitude, so there was a lot of joking up to this point. Um, but what's interesting is this morning, I was like, well, when I woke up, this is real, you know. Um, I kind of rolled out of bed before Martin's thinking, okay, wow, this is real. I'm going to actually read 100 pages. <laughs> Of scholastic work a day. I'm here in the middle right now. I'm taking a little bit of a break, but um, yeah, it's just kind of crazy. Uh, I'm reading through quite a bit. I've gone through 23 pages thus far of the first stage reading, and uh, already um, in this section of the Prima Pars, a lot of these things um, I've covered before in my own personal study. So this is the treatise on the one God, right? The Deo Uno covers questions 2 through 26 of the Prima Pars, and there's a couple things sticking out to me, some of which I'll get into in later clips. But one of the things I'll share with you guys right now that's very interesting is this reality that Aquinas talks about, according from Augustine, if my memory serves, this idea that the slightest knowledge of God, of the blessed, if you will, is greater than, uh, you know, all of the knowledge or even the most certain knowledge of earthly things, which goes to show us how much more we should 
treasure and love the science that is theology, the science that God has revealed to man, that even the slightest of true information from heaven is going to be infinitely better than any of the um, you know, created or natural truths that are out there. So something very interesting to think about, especially in the beginning as you're diving into this whole massive three-volume tome, um, this reality I think is very interesting. After the office of Prime, the community comes together at 10 o'clock for the daily High Mass. As I drove down to High Mass from the old monastery, and as I participated inside of the liturgy, Aquinas' five ways and reflective questions started to come to mind. When we think of the first way, his argument for motion, in the ebb and flow of the Catholic Mass, from the procession to the recessional, how do you perceive the concept of motion as a reflection of God's continuous presence and the influence in the liturgy? In his second argument, it's the famous argument from cause and effect. As I participated in the Mass, I considered the intricate rituals and symbols. How do you see cause and effect in the relationship in this context when we worship the divine, fostering a deeper understanding of God's role in the ultimate as the ultimate cause. His third argument was the argument from contingency. Reflecting on the contingent elements in the Mass, for instance, the liturgical seasons, the sacraments, and the ever-changing readings, how does the concept of contingency highlight our dependency and our worship on a higher and necessary being? His fourth argument was from degrees of perfection. As we engage in the Mass, with its layers of symbolism, sacred music, communal prayers, how do these elements contribute to a sense of increasing perfection, pointing towards the ultimate perfection found in God? Finally, I consider the reality that because God is the governor of the world, his perfect design is in motion, which is the fifth argument. How do we consider the order and the purpose inherent in the structure of the Mass, from the prayers at the foot of the altar, to the Kyrie, the Gospel, to the dismissal? How does the design of the liturgy reflect the idea of an intelligent and purposeful Creator guiding the faithful towards a deeper connection with the Divine? As I reflected on these truths in the context of the traditional Mass, I realized that the Great Mover the first cause was before me in the Holy Eucharist, and I knew that this was an adventure that I was never going to forget. All right, so this is day two, and I'm starting to get, I think, somewhat of a realization of how long this period is going to last. I mean, I'm kind of the person that, you know, when you hear a month at a monastery it kind of just rolls off the scalp if you will i'm just like oh okay you know it's a trip but two days in i'm like wow this is uh this is gonna be a little long so um what have i learned thus far reflection wise what have i learned reflection wise there's been a couple interesting things so i'm about you know 30 or so odd questions into the prima cards and there's like two major themes that are kind of coming to the forefront of my mind as I'm reading. The first is this idea that I am, uh, you know, kind of a spiritual beggar. What I mean by that is when you read St. Thomas and you see the detail and the care that he's giving, and you recognize on the one hand that each one of these articles could technically be a book, um, but the detail and care that he gives in exposition of the, the, the sacred theology. It's something that's very humbling because I think especially in modern 21st century American parlance, we make religion so personalized, and when I mean personalized, I don't just mean kind of according to our own norms or wishes, but we generally let our emotions dictate how we view God. Whereas Aquinas is really approaching things from how, who is God in and of himself through scripture, through tradition, and through natural reason. And so I've recognized, number one, just like how low a view I think I have of God, in the sense that when you start to contemplate the eternality of God, the infinity of God, the immutability of God, 
and these are indistinguishable from who he is in his own essence. That he is his eternal knowledge. He is his own charity. He is his knowledge. Um, when you start to meditate on these, these realities, they start to really weigh on the mind in the sense of how beautiful they are, but also just how absolutely mind-boggling and un, um, that the intellect is so bound by time that it's so hard to even grasp some of these things in the sense of their fullness. You can understand elements, of course, but in their fullness. Um, and then the second thing is recognizing how absolutely horrible, um, what a horror it is to sin. Because when you realize that God is his own eternality, that he has no beginning, that he has no end, that he has loved you for forever, before time, and that he did not have to make us, that there was no necessity upon him to make mankind, and yet he chose to do so. What love is this? What love is this that actually does that? It's something that, um, to me, is not just beautiful, but also it goes to show you, uh, or at least goes to show me, how poor my response is to that said love of God. Um, yet my response is, it's so small, it's so, it's so minuscule. So then whenever I go inside of the Mass, when I go inside and I hear the office being prayed and I think about these things, they're just, they, they weigh very heavy, but in a beautiful way. Theology should not be studied just to accumulate knowledge, right? If you're just kind of going to theology as a science, it is, but if you're just going as a scientist, just to kind of understand the data, you'll of course get much, but you're missing the whole point. This theology has to not just be um, ingested into the intellect, but it has to be prayed. It has to be it has to be lived. It has to become part of your bones. It has to be uh, infused into your marrow. It has to be become. It has to become part of you because this desire for God, this um, desire for unity, is something that I think we all desire once we understand these things. Because we all naturally desire our own good, but in desiring our own good, we desire God. So these are just some of the kind of random thoughts that are going through my mind but i'm going to keep going at it and uh we'll see what else we learn along this journey also one thing that's also been cool is that i've been able to meet a few of you guys here a few of the meaning of catholic family uh has been here at clear creek abbey uh, some of them live around here but also some of them are uh, visiting and so uh yeah it's great to meet you guys if you guys ever uh by random chance happen to see me in person come say hey i'll be happy to talk to you and catch up on day three in the afternoon, I went to adoration. Every Thursday evening, the monks expose our blessed Lord in the blessed sacrament at the old monastery in the old chapel. This time of adoration was very soothing for my heart because up to this point in my personal life, I have been struggling with many things when it came to my relationship with friends. I've had friends in the past who I've had misunderstandings with, and unfortunately, because of my own personal failings or because of our mutual lack of maturity, things have unfortunately gone sour. I'm an individual who's given over to being quite uh, introspective. And oftentimes, because of my more melancholic ta uh, nature, I find myself feeling guilty when people become angry with me for some reason. Uh, and I find that whenever I come before our blessed Lord, I'm able to think more clearly and more accurately about certain situations in my life. So this is the end of day three. And at the moment, I'm around f almost 50 questions in to the Prima Pars. It's kind of interesting. The thoughts initially as I'm kind of getting my bearing, if you will, when it comes to this routine. As I've been reading through these questions, you know, he starts off talking with his first question on essentially methodology, but then he goes into the treatise on the one God, questions two through 26, and then from 27 to, I think it's like 43 or something like that, somewhere in there, he talks about the Trinity. And what's interesting is that <clears throat> as you think about these deep truths, which I mean, I don't know if there's really any deeper truths then, god himself or the trinity outside of you know the incarnational reality or things along that nature the redemption when you start to think about these things and in the context of liturgy where there's silence there's a sacred language there is 
incense. There is all these proper things that are so fitting for the worship of God. It makes you recognize um, not to take things like the Latin Mass or the traditional office for granted. It makes you also feel very humbled. One of the things I've been kind of feeling as I've been going along the last couple days or so is kind of this, as I've been talking about, this feeling of being almost a spiritual pauper, um, just being such a, such a, you know, um, so I feel so inadequate, I guess. That's kind of the term, so inadequate, because as I've been thinking about the person of God, just absolutely how immense he is, but then at the same time, how small I am and that my existence is nothing more than an act of God's love. Not that he had to create me to um, have someone around, right? God is perfectly happy and um, joyful in and of himself, but that he made it purely out of his own love. Not that, again, that he had to. What is my response? My response has to be one of gratitude. But then I look at my life and I say, wow, there's just so much ingratitude. How often do we give God thanks for the things in our lives? You know, when I was a kid, we I learned things like, you know, thanking God for, for food, thanking God for, for shelter. But then as, you know, time goes along, as time goes along, there's this tendency just to kind of see, it's the prideful tendency, man, to see all of your monetary successes through the lens of, I did this, no one helped me, I, I picked myself up by my bootstraps, this type, this type of mentality. And while, of course, you know, you should work hard, we have to recognize that everything good comes from God. Even things that are not pleasant come from God uh, when it comes to, you know, certain calamities that we experience, that they happen for our good. Now, of course, God doesn't will sin actively or passively in any way, but God is able to use um, the suffering of this world, the the sadness of this world, even this feeling of inadequacy that I feel for our own good. So yeah, these are kind of some of my initial thoughts. Of course, I'm going to be sharing with you guys a little bit more of the details of the questions that I've been reading over, but these are just some of my more kind of raw personal thoughts outside of the study room. Yeah, we'll see what happens tomorrow. So tomorrow, we're, uh, as you guys have seen, I've already showed you the old monastery and given you guys a little bit of a tour with that as well as a little bit of the history tomorrow we're going to be moving into the new monastery to uh for, for the rest of our stay it looks like um but then i'll also be showing you guys a little bit more of what that looks like and some of the history that is involved with it and as we continue on we're going to be going and talking a little bit more over the treatise on creation the treatise on the angels and on man the last end as we're finishing up this prima pars in this first week um it's going to be interesting and uh, if I get any more interesting meditation ideas, I guess, or, or thoughts that come to mind, I'll definitely share it with you guys. So anyway, off to Compline in just a little bit, and uh, it'll be a, a nice finish to a very good day. As the night drew down to a close and Compline began, Hearing the Salve Regina and thinking about the fact that St. Thomas sung this every single night of his monastic life was something that touched me profoundly. We as Catholics hold Our Lady in great veneration, but yet at the same time, because of secular and Protestant influences, oftentimes we'll be ashamed of the joy and of the love that we should have toward our mother. As the candles burned, I was reminded of the burning heart that we should have toward Christ that can only be inflamed by the devotion to Our Lady. If we become more like Mary, then we will become more like Christ. On day five, First real question started to hit me. The questions along the nature of, do I know God and do I even know myself? You see, when you look at the monks, when you see that the way that they live, they do the same routine every single day. A secularist might be tempted to say that it is pointless and vain repetition. But yet when you start to sit down and look at the immensity 
what God is, you cannot help but ask yourself, what am I doing with my life, and do I know him? So it's the end of day five, and I've been just finishing up the treatise on the angels and then the treatise on the creation uh, of the world, I guess, in six days. Thoughts for today? Well, there's this line that St. Thomas uses when he's describing the fall of specifically Lucifer. Um, and, and you can apply this to a degree, of, of course, to the, to the demons, but he talks about how pride and envy are uniquely the sins of the demons because since demons don't have corporeal substances, since they don't have bodies, that's just what it means, they aren't going to be tempted with the sins of the flesh, right? Lust and gluttony, drunkenness, things like this. But they are going to be tempted with pride and with envy. But how often are pride and envy really the root causes of the sins that we struggle with? He talks about later on, I haven't gotten to this, but I've read this before, that pride really is the mother of all sins, whereas humility is kind of the mother of all virtues in, cert in a certain sense. But then he uses a more convicting concept post this, which he says that the reason that the devil fell was for two principal reasons. First, that he wanted to create out of his own power, apart from that of God. He wanted to be like God in creating. But then at the second thing, and I think that this is the more convicting thing for all of us is that the devil and the demons want beatitude they want to reach beatitude by their own power alone without the assistance of god or anybody else how often is that really our practical attitude we want to be saved but we want to do it ourselves how many catholics uh, who suffer from lukewarmity think that it's just by keeping the commandments alone apart from god's grace that were saved act like practical Pelagians, don't even know the message of the gospel, don't even know that Christ died for their sins and that grace is given to them through the instrumentality of the sacraments. Something convicting about to think about, something convicting for me in my own life as I ask myself, am I striving out of the, the flesh of man? Am I striving out of the power of man to save myself or am I actually relying upon the grace of God? Something for all of us to pray about and think about. And so I'm here now, right, with the looming towers behind me, about to go into Compline. I know you guys are all in my prayers, and uh, we'll see what takes place tomorrow. As the first Sunday at my stay at the monastery came around, I was touched in many ways by not just the truths that I was learning in the speculative realm through St. Thomas's Summa, but also by the profound beauty that God has created in nature. This profound beauty expresses itself in many ways through the mountains and the trees around the monastery, but I would argue most especially in the families and in the individuals who frequent the masses and the offices at the monastery. This community of individuals I found to be very special, a tight-knit group of people who had genuine charity for one another. Genuine care, genuine joy, genuine fellowship, and who welcomed me with open arms as a total stranger this is something that is alien to the world in which we live in today, particularly here in the West. So seeing the joy these individuals had in their hospitality reminded me so much of the hospitality that Christ has for us in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. These individuals, with their small acts of love, whether that be 
an invitation to dinner, or simply willing to talk to me for five minutes, showed me so much of the love that Christ has for us in the sacred mysteries. That Christ lived, he taught, he performed miracles, and that he died and rose again, all for the salvation of the world's souls. As I continued to observe the monks, I recognized that this trip was going to be a trip that not only would change my life, but that would also invoke deep questions of personal accountability to myself. How do I treat others that are around me? How do I treat my friends back home? What kind of man do I want to be? And what kind of man will Christ have me become? <clears throat> so it's the end of day six, and it's uh, Sunday, eighth Sunday after Pentecost. And uh, it's been quite an interesting day, to say the least. Got up early, went to Mottens and Louds, and then Low Mass, and then did my studies. But one thing that has been very impactful for me today, and this is kind of a reflection that I get every single time that I come to Clear Creek Monastery, is the amount of charity, genuine charity, that the faithful and that the monks have for one another. A charity that is something that is on the one hand extremely convicting, but on the other hand it's something that is extremely um, inspiring. Me wanting to do better <clears throat> in my own Catholic life in the context of following Christ and loving other people. On Catholic YouTube, we hear this term charity thrown all around. Much charity, be charitable, all these types of ridiculous things. And it's become a meme. It's completely a joke. We hear now that phrase thrown around so much that it's lost its meaning. It's like the term racist. It's completely lost its meaning. Um, it's completely detached from what we've traditionally taught on the subject. And at the end of the day, it's just kind of become a mock. But when I come here, every single time I come here, I see the genuineness of people, which is something that's so beautiful because it was something that was at one time so common in the United States and Western Europe when Catholic culture was, uh, in certain areas, so strong. Now, of course, it's much smaller. Now, of course, it's much uh, more rare to find genuine people who care about the faith, who desire their children to go to heaven and strive to follow what has been given on. I had the opportunity today to sit down with a couple of friends from the Meaning of Catholic, the Harrisons who live here. And I got to see the way they interact with their children, the way they interact with one another, the way that they welcomed myself into their home, served me lunch, and then uh, proceeded to show me so much of their own apostolate, right, which I'll be, which I've been showing a little bit in this video. And seeing the genuineness and the charity of the family toward one another, and seeing this also with other families, is something that on the one hand is so beautiful, but it's also very sad. It's not very sad what they're doing, but it's very sad because at the same time, I want that. I want that love for other people. I want other people to live that way. And currently where I'm at right now, in the context of where I actually live, that's just not a thing. Some of you guys who at least follow me on the traditional Thomas know that we're in a war, right? We're fighting against the wickedness that's going on in the United States, whether that be uh, through the, uh, the rainbow movement or through the infanticide movement or things along that nature. But when you come to holy places like this and you see the love, the genuineness, the care, the fun that these people have, and then you remind yourself of where you are back home, it can be very sad. There's like a certain holy envy that you have of, uh, of the people. So, how are we loving one another? How are we taking care of one another? How are we loving God? Definitely been the reflections that I've thought about this day. And it ties in perfectly with what I've been discussing, or reading rather, thus far in the Summa. St. Thomas is talking so much about this idea that God has created man, not out of necessity, but purely out of his own goodness. God is goodness itself. He is one with his essence. His attributes are the same as his essence. So God does not have goodness. He does not have love, but he is love. He is goodness itself. And all goodness 
and love and being itself flow from God. Well, this God created you without any necessity to do so, purely out of the desire to share goodness with you. It's something that when you think about it, weighs really heavy. It's very beautiful. How does this play into the incarnation, to the redemption and resurrection and glorification? It's something that's very weighty, very beautiful. And then whenever you get to see a little bit of it manifested in a great family like the Harrisons, it's something that's convicting because you want that on the one hand, but then you also remind yourself that by the grace of God, you can live that way. So yeah, it's been interesting thus far. But we're going to go now I'm back over that way to the monastery for the Office of Compline. And as the day fades, I'm reminded of the love that we should have. That just as the candles burn all night, in honor of our Lord and Our Lady, our hearts should be aflamed with love for both. As the days continue to go along, I am struck by the profound silence that one experiences inside of the monastic world. In my reading of St. Thomas, I am reminded of the reality that before all things, God was, and that my creation, and that his creation of me, he did as a pure gift of his love. This reality astounds me. How do we respond to God's love? Do we accept it as the free gift that it is, or do we shirk it because we would rather hold on to some false, supposed good? What are you holding on to? Lust, envy, pride will never satisfy because you are made for God. So it's the end of day seven, and I'm in the middle of the treatise on man, headed into the treatise on the divine government. But man, what a day it's been. It's been really interesting. So we're here a week in. What are my thoughts on just being in a monastery for a week? First off, you know, I've done this before, like I've said, but I think, to my knowledge, all of my trips have been somewhere between seven to ten days, something like that. Maybe, maybe at the most two weeks. Um... And I think the real reality of, like, I am here for this long has set in, um, which it's interesting because it's kind of like, whoa, you know, um, this is not something I'm doing overnight. But what's so cool is as I'm getting more and more into this rhythm of study, of prayer, of meditation, of reflection on self and reflection about the exterior world, there's a lot of interesting things that are coming up in my mind. On the one hand, when it comes to myself, I continue to be just amazed at how little I know. Um, looking at the different faculties of the soul is what Aquinas is talking about right now. The intellect, the will, free will, the irascible and concupiscible appetites. All these things I've known for a while because I've read through this stuff before. But what's so interesting to me is this concept of man seeking after the good and it's only through divine grace that we can really attain that which is objectively good. Ultimately, God, and then lesser, to lesser extents, virtue, holiness, etc. But how does this apply to things in the world right now? More specifically, things in the church. We all desire the good. But we all have to be informed by right reason, according to divine revelation, and natural reason on what is the objective good. When we look at the synod and synodality, we see, I think, the most clearest, most clear manifestation of modernism since Pashendi in 1907 by Pius X. And it's scary. I'm looking around here and I'm recognizing that there is a strong potential that the church is going to have a legitimate schism, maybe uh, Avignon Papacy 2.0, if you will. But then I look at it, and I look and I say, well, those individuals who are promoting the synodal way, the acceptance of uh, the rainbow movement, of infanticide, things along that nature, whether they know it or not, they desire the good. They desire justice. They desire 
equity, even though arguable, whatever, <laughs> that's really a good. But they desire what in their mind is the good, goods. We desire the good as traditionalists, as Catholics faithful to the church of all time. But what is the good? Because our goods are contradicting each other. Ultimately, we have to go back to that which is objective, that which is revealed in sacred scripture. And that's, of course, where the departure is going to be. There's going to be this departure between the synodal conciliar church and the Catholic church on this point. So as we navigate this next week, I'm going to be thinking more about this. But just brief reflections. In this time of present crisis, in this time of potential schism slash Avignon papacy 2.0, are you pursuing the objective good? Are you pursuing God as he has revealed himself? If you're wanting to understand God better, look no further than the Holy Scriptures. Look no further than a detailed explanation in St. Thomas's writings. You'll understand who God is, and then you'll be able to ask yourself, what God does the conciliar church worship? What God does the Catholic church worship? What God am I worshiping? Am I worshiping the Divine Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Or am I worshipping self? Am I worshipping money? Am I worshipping physical pleasures? Am I, am I worshipping friendships or, 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 or marriages? Or things that aren't necessarily bad, but are not rightly ordered. Remember, God did not have to create you. He didn't. He didn't he, there was no necessity for him to do so. But yet he did so out of sure act of his goodness. Outside of all time so that he could share his goodness with you. Not that he needed to, not that he was unhappy. He was per perfectly content in himself, but yet he shares his goodness with us. And once we realize that, we need to ask ourselves the question, who are we to say that the things that we're pursuing should take a precedent over living the life of saints, pursuing the objective good? What are you pursuing? Pray about it and ask yourself that question. It's a hard question, but ask yourself it. Here at the end of a week, I'm asking myself, what have I learned? Back home, what am I living? Most people know me as a YouTube host, as a theology nerd. But what am I pursuing? Am I, am I pursuing clicks? Am I pursuing likes? Am I pursuing subscribers? Am I pursuing a lifestyle which is just trying to get myself and my platform well, more well-known? Or am I genuinely pursuing virtue? The more I look at my life, the more I recognize how much I need to be better. But it's not my own actions that can. It's ultimately divine grace. This impression, this tendency in the soul, as he's going to be talking about later in the, in the Prima Secundae, on grace. What are you pursuing? My fellow creators, what are you guys pursuing? Think about it. It's a tough question. Here at the end of another long day, about to go back in there to do Compline. But yeah, really enjoying what I'm learning. And uh, theology when done in a monastic context where we actually are praying and meditating and studying traditional scholasticism. If it wasn't for the fact that I know I'm supposed to be married, it's definitely tempting. I'll put it to you that way. And so, ask yourself that question. What are you pursuing? I'll see you guys tomorrow. St. Thomas Aquinas finishes his first section of the Summa Theologiae with an in-depth discussion upon God's governance over mankind. Watching the monks and seeing their simple and faithful trust in God reminded me of how much we as human beings are one in need of Him, but two ought to give ourselves over to Him in every action that we do whether it be in small acts of trust, or whether it be the call to martyrdom, man is called to give himself over to God. For in God we have our very breath and our very existence.
Cicada does not want to be quiet. The end of day eight. It's been an interesting day. I'm almost done with the Prima Pars, which is a exhilarating feeling. I've read most of the Prima Pars before, like some 95% of it. But being almost done is uh, an exhilarating feeling. Thoughts for today? Definitely learned a lot, but there's this concept that keeps coming back to me, which is this idea of how are we in the small things allowing the Holy Ghost to penetrate our lives? I've been thinking about recently this quote by St. Alphonsus, where he's basically talking about lukewarmity, and he talks about how basically what lukewarmity is, a soul who doesn't want to commit mortal sin, recognizes it, but yet at the same time goes on, and what he ends up doing is living a life of deliberate venial sin. But I was thinking about this in the context of the day-to-day -day life. For instance, if I love God and I'm seeking the good, then why should I be so selfish for how much food I can possibly get at table? Why should I always be seeking the best chair as opposed to giving it to somebody else like James chapter 2 talks about? These little things that I recognize, these little selfish tendencies inside of me and are probably inside of you as well, um, that bug me. So it begs that question, how are we better serving him? How are, you, how are we choosing to live our lives? Oklahoma, lots of bugs out here. Anyway, it's definitely something to continue to meditate on. So, I'm going to go in now for Compline. I'll see you guys tomorrow. And uh, tomorrow when we finish up the Prima Pars, uh, it's definitely going to be uh, an interesting time. What we're going to do is we're going to reflect over what we've learned as you've been going, as you've already seen, I've been taking you through it. But I'm just going to kind of reflect in a general live sense on what are my thoughts and what does this mean going forward as we're now talking about subjects like divine beatitude. How this place back here and how this simple life that's out here is actually, while great, it's only going to be a mechanism that's going to help you attain full happiness, which can only be found in God. So yeah, we're going to talk about it. I'll see you guys tomorrow. St. Thomas begins his first part of the second part of the Summa, what's often called the Prima Secundae, 
with one of the most important treatises that one can cover in theology. It's the subject of final beatitude and how all of our actions, all of the world is orientated toward one final end, that end ultimately being salvation with God and union with him in the beatific vision. As the days continued to roll along and the routine became standard, I realized that in the Mass and in the Divine Liturgy, that all of our actions are orientated toward this very moment on earth, the Eucharist and the consuming thereof is why we were made for this earth. We are made to know, love, and serve God, and this cannot happen anywhere better than in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So I just finished the Prima Pars. It's been eight or nine days, um, but what a phenomenal piece of literature. What a phenom phenomenal piece of theology. Now we're going to be jumping into the Prima Secundae, which, um, as I kind of hinted at uh, earlier, I've read the Prima Pars, most of it, I'd say at least 95, 98% of it already before. I have next to no experience of the Prima Secundae, aside from a couple areas. Um, and so this will be a very interesting read because this is going to be very fresh. There's a lot that I learned here, a lot that I've been explaining to you guys, but what is going to be found in here, I think is going to be some of the most interesting stuff that I've read because I've gone ahead and peeked a bit in personal studies months back at this beginning section of the Prima Secundae, which is sometimes called the Treatise on Beatitude uh, or the Treatise on the Last End. And it's one of the most interesting subject matters, I would say, because what it's covering is this question of what is man's last end? And then it asks poignant uh, and un very, um, it asks very good questions. Because it asks questions like, will riches make us happy? Will food make us happy? Will pleasures make us happy? And then ultimately it's going to get down to the reality that because God is our last end, and happiness can only come through the contemplation of the divine essence, that we will only truly be happy in God and ultimately only be really happy when we're beholding his divine essence by the light of divine grace in the beatific vision. This is something obviously that it runs completely contrary to secular society, which aside from the fact that secular society is going to tell you um, that there really isn't a God or maybe God is just kind of this tailor-made being in your mind that acquiesces to whatever you want him to do, or something to that effect. This idea that God is our last and that he is what's going to make us satisfied and not physical pleasures is something that is challenging. It's something that's hard to believe. Um, if you have, I think, a maybe uh, inadequate or um, maybe a, a, an impoverished view of God. It's going to be quite interesting to see what happens, but we're going to go ahead and dive in and uh, see what I can glean in the sense of uh, how this applies very much so to uh, personal life, as it were. When the daily tasks of necessity are complete around the monastery, the monks would gather together in the crypt for private prayer. While being with the monks in this setting, in the very beginning I found myself horridly affronted by the reality of my own sin. I was scared to be with my own thoughts for a long time. However, as time went on, I realized that silence with God and the closeness that one can have with him in the united mental prayer, God will destroy any and all fears, and he will gaze upon mankind with unabounding love. It's the end of day nine, and we've finished the Prima Pars, as I've said, in one of the scenes of this documentary. Kind of enjoying the evening right now. There's some very beautiful pink skies. And reflective over 
some very interesting pieces that I'm learning and kind of mentally contemplating uh, certain truths about angels. You say angels? What are you, what are you thinking about angels for right now? There's this part in, I think it's question 113 of the Prima Parge, where St. Thomas talks about guardian angels. And in a response to an objection that he lays out, he talks about how, on the one hand, God has given us all angels, like guardian angels for our own protection. But for the, those people who have fallen, he has a demon reserved for them in hell. It's a very interesting take especially when you couple this with the idea that God is at the same time wanting your salvation but yet is at, at the same time completely just something to reflect over is the soberness of the holiness of God I was talking with some people that I've met here and uh, we were talking about the question of whether or not we think scrupulosity or presumption is a, is a, is a worse problem right now inside of the church in the traditionalist movement, we definitely have our bouts with scruples. I definitely had uh, a pretty severe one when I first converted to the church. Maybe I'll make a video about that in the future, how to deal with scrupulosity from a trad Catholic perspective, because the saints, they have the answers. The church in her moral manuals has the answers for it. But I think presumption is the thing that we struggle more with. When you compare our lives to the lives of the saints, the lives and the medievals, there does seem to be this very strong tendency of wanting to do whatever we want. Just a little sin here, I'll go to confession tomorrow, this type of mentality. We got to remember that God is holy, that God is just, and that there should be a certain reverential awe that we call fear of God. Something to think about. Anyway, I think it's about three more weeks that we still have here crazy that it's uh already been a little over a week uh but yeah we have three more weeks that are going to be here so yeah now in the first stages of the prima secunde uh going through that and uh treatise on divine beatitude definitely a beautiful one so yeah i'll keep you guys updated gonna head into compla now so I'll see you guys tomorrow <laughs>
St. Thomas continues his Prima Secunde with the reality that as man is struggling through this life, he goes through bouts with the passions, bouts with vice, bouts with sin, but ultimately divine grace is needed in order for him to be sanctified and to be able to fight off these enemies. But more than just resisting sin, man is able to have his very nature transformed. Your nature, my friends, which is a nature of corruption, a nature which you recognize is flawed. We all desire our own good and our own perfection, but yet we cannot attain it by our own power and by our own strength. It requires a supernatural healer, a supernatural effect, and this happens in divine grace. Through divine grace, we can become like God. We can become holy. We can truly become a new creation. As I continued to watch throughout the days, I saw the weather changing from one thing to another, from stormy to sunny, from cloudy, nighttime. And I was reminded on the reality that as life continues to go by, we will have ups and downs in the spiritual life. But ultimately, we have to trust in God's plan for us and continue to persevere with him humbly in in the daily walk of sanctifying grace and salvation. Without this, my friends, we will be totally lost.
As St. Thomas begins his largest section of the Summa, what is commonly referred to as the Secunda Secunde, or the second part of the second part, he opens with a grand treatise on the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. These theological virtues ultimately unite us to God, both allowing us to believe the things that he has revealed to us, based off of the credibility of the revealer, allows us to hope in him and to have a filial trust in him that his promises for us are true and that his grace is sufficient for us to attain heaven. And ultimately, charity allows us to be united to God and to love him as he ought to be loved out of love of him and of who he is and allow ourselves to love one another out of ultimate love of God. Joining the monks on processions in their divine office, in the masses, in the prayers, reminded me so much of the importance that man should have in this life, that man should prioritize uh, what he studies. He should be studying not just the vulgar things of this earth that will one day pass away, but ultimately be studying the faith and the divine realities in order to better understand this God. If man is to understand truly who God is, he must strive after him and seek to understand him with his entire mind. If man is to hope in him and hope to attain the promises of salvation, he must first understand what God says. How can a man be saved? How can a man be regenerate? And then press on into that reality. Man can have a confident hope in God, a hope that is not slavish in scrupulosity, nor perverse in presumption. But ultimately, man must unite himself to God by divine charity. And this charity can only come about through the sacraments and through prayer. Found in the Catholic Church, sanctifying grace which transforms man's heart in, from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh allows man to have this charity allows him to have this, as the book of Deuteronomy talks about, circumcision of the heart that enables him to love God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, and with all his strength. Aquinas then goes forward from there and talks about the great moral virtues, in particular, the four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. We often hear, especially in the context of the internet, Catholics use the word prudent, such and such should be prudent, you should be prudent, the Holy Father's being imprudent, things along that nature. But yet how many Catholics, again, know what this word means? Like charity, the word prudent has lost its meaning because of the ineptitude and inaccuracies of various Catholic YouTubers. Prudence is the spiritual know-how virtue that enables man to order his life towards the salvific end, toward the beatific vision in which man is made to be. Justice allows him to treat one another and ultimately to order his life toward God so that he can render to each man and render to God that which he owes. Whether it be in the context of the priest offering up sacrifice to God in the sacrifice of the mass, the highest act of the virtue of religion, or whether it be a mother and father disciplining their children or misbehaving. It's all going to come down to how does man act in a just and holy fashion. These virtues are infused into our faculties and allow our nature to be transformed. We also see with temperance and fortitude that our most base desires, desires when it comes to actions like food and drink, sleep, and human sexuality are regulated by the virtue of temperance. And that this regulation also allows us in tandem with fortitude to not strike out in passion or to not shirk in absolute fear. Watching the monks and their completely well-disciplined spiritual life realize made the realization to me that these individuals are like a spiritual sword that continues to be honed. As the scripture says, iron sharpens iron. These individuals are a well-honed sword, ready to fight off the temptations of life. But to become a well-honed sword, you must have the edges scraped off of you. You must become polished. You must become sharp.
is this the life that we live in the secular world or is this life that is foreign to us we must ask ourselves this ultimate question Well, just finished up the Prima Secunde and uh, had a little bit of a loss for words how um, amazing and how in depth this was. Reading through the Summa cover to cover really is the way to do it because every question, every article, every subject builds upon one another in order to show the reader, to show the students, and to paint a portrait for the viewer, a full outline of the religion that God has given man. And when you start off with God, who he is, and his um, one nature, and his triune nature, then you move on into creation on man and angels, creation in general, work of the six days and then you move into the Prima Secunde and you go through the attribute the final beatitude what is man all of his different faculties um, in the context of passions and, and things like that and you get into you know sin on the law on grace it's painting a beautiful picture of what the faith really is well onward to the Secunda Secunda and the Tertiary Parts.
All right, so done with volume number one. It took quite a while to get done, but now we're on to volume number two, the treatise on faith, the beginning of Secunda Secunde. So I don't know if technically this is the halfway point, um, but it's practically halfway since there's really only um, three-ish slash four parts in the first one, if you include the supplement. I include the supplement, but I, I don't know if other people do. So, all right, let's get to it. This is one of these parts where, as I've been finishing up the treatise on charity in the middle of, or I guess early portion of the Secunda Secunde. When I take this idea of charity, this is something that at least in my personal context, growing up as an evangelical, hearing the phrase love or charity, love one another as I have loved you, Christianity is about love. This is something that's been, you know, very much a central to my faith, if you will, growing up. But learning actually fully what charity is has provoked some very interesting emotions and questions in my mind. One thing that I've been thinking about is the fact that <clears throat> we're called to have charity but then how many of us actually practice it? It's somewhat bittersweet. When I first came here about a month ago now, there was a group of about, I'd say a dozen or so gentlemen who were staying here. 
and a lot of them were staying for a long time, 10, 12, 15 days, um, some of them even longer. But now the last one just left and it's bittersweet because now it's kind of like, you know, outside of the Summa reading and prayer, getting to meet really cool people and getting to engage in conversations about faith, about life with them and hearing their stories, their opinions, their perspectives is something that I very much enjoy. And it's cool because it's like, you know, you're all taken out of, if you will, like one particular place and then, or different places rather, but then thrown together into a particular place. But when they all leave, it becomes quite sad because you've made friendships, you've made connections with them. So now it's interesting because now it's just kind of me and the remainder of the book, me and the remainder of the Summa, it's kind of like just us two squaring off. Can I finish in time? Can I actually do this? I've learned so much. And in the context of the monastic setting, it's changed me so much. I think back a little bit about just about ways that I've lived in my life and ways that I want to continue to live my life. I think to put it very mildly, I have a lot of work to do. A lot of work to improve, a lot of work to change because when I look at the way that the brothers, in even the smallest of actions, love one another and care about one another and strive to honor God in every action that they do. When I see this embedded in the Summa become manifest in real life, whether it be in the liturgy, whether it be in the work. And when I see and compare my own life to that, and I see my own shortcomings, my own failures, my own need for grace, my own need to be sanctified and to be changed. It's very convicting. It's hard to put it into words, but the best way I can describe it is the Catholic faith, and even more so life, makes sense in a setting like this. It makes the world make total sense. So yeah. Now it's just me and the sumo. And we're gonna finish up. So, it should be interesting to see what happens.
As I finished up the second part of the second part of St. Thomas' Summa and entered into the third part, and then finally the supplement, the magnum opus of Aquinas became alive. It became alive in the treatise on the person of Christ. Up to this point in my life, I had read the Bible several times through. I understood what historical Christianity stated about the person of Jesus Christ. But meditating upon the truths of who he is in the context of the liturgy, in the context of monastic silence, began to show me that the statement, you shall never fully understand the person of Christ in a thousand lives, how true that statement was. I found it absolutely incredible that Christ on the one hand um, was an infinite being, right? The second person of the blessed Trinity, an infinite being, but yet at the same time becomes a finite man, a man like me, a man like you. What is so profound about this sacred mystery is on the one hand, its its weight, its depth, its height, but then also the little attention that we pay to this great mystery. It wasn't until becoming Catholic that I started to see the goodness of man's nature. While man's nature, in the context of his soul, is wounded grievously by sin, it is not corrupted to the point of no return. It is not bound by its own nature to where it cannot make a free will choice, especially when that choice is motivated by divine grace. Man's heart, man's nature can be healed by grace, but there is still so much good that is left in man. All of this good ultimately goes back to the great handiwork of God as creator. But recognizing that Christ became a man challenged my preconceptions of man's nature. In so many ways, remnants of my old belief system of seeing man as a totally corrupt or a totally depraved person were being shattered. The realization that man's nature is not bound totally by sin, but that it can be transformed, that Christ would assume our nature, though be without sin, and live a sinless life on this earth, and then die for you and for me, while all the while not demanding anything in return, except that we merely surrender our will to his perfect and loving one. These realities started to really sink in home, especially as the monks one evening exposed our blessed Lord again in the sacrament. But then in all the solemnity of a Benedictine community proceeded to chant the Psalms as well as the hymns of St. Thomas Aquinas. Hearing the Adorato de Devote, that famous hymn by Aquinas, while reading Aquinas' treatise on the Eucharist brought me to tears. I recognized that up to this point, so much of my study had been motivated by trying to understand who God is. And while we cannot separate prayer from study, we must recognize that God is not just some abstract thing that you can scientifically study under a book under the lens of a microscope, for lack of better words, but that he is a person. He is a personal being. And seeing him in the Eucharist, hearing Aquinas' hymns being played, seeing the incense fly upward towards heaven, began to show me the realization that I will spend the rest of my life in awe, basking on my knees in front of our Lord, recognizing my own humble failings, but yet his beautiful ability to transform me into a saint if I cooperate with his will. As this documentary closes, one thing that I found as I finished at the Summa Theologiae, aside from just the uh, immense um, sense of accomplishment that it felt as I finished, was the realization not just of how little I know, but of how little the world knows. 
The Catholic faith is the most beautiful thing that God has given to us. And the sad thing is, is that people in the church, either on the one hand, do not know about this faith in large numbers. Massive amounts of Catholics do not even know basic catechetical facts. But then on the other hand, there is a subversive movement of individuals inside of the church who want to change the pure teachings of Jesus Christ, who want to change the glorious traditional liturgy, who want to rid the world of everything that says Jesus Christ, and want to embrace a secular, modernistic idolatry that ultimately places man as the source and summit of all things on earth. This is so sad, my friends, especially when we're in a world that needs the gospel, that needs the message of Christ. And so my prayer is, is that as I finished the Summa, I prayed that God would not just use me, but that he would use you, everybody who watches this documentary, as well as all Catholics, to become invigorated in studying the truths of the Catholic faith in a holistic and a systematic way. But then not just to bilk in knowledge, not just to have a swollen head and a shrunken heart, but rather that our hearts would burst with love of God and that we would be motivated by this love to share the truths of the gospel and to evangelize the Catholic faith to every lost soul. There is a movement that says, do not proselytize. There are individuals that say, don't share the gospel with the non-believer. My friends, Christ says, go forth into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. As I watched the monks, I recognized that even by their simplistic lives of solitude, of prayer, of work, and of silence, that these individuals are not only striving by the grace of God to have their own souls transformed and saved by Christ, but also to become Christ on this earth for others. Every day these monks pray for the salvation of the world and the restoration of the church. I took 30 days out of my life to spend trying to understand the Catholic faith. And all I can say to you, my friends, is that I don't know what God will do with me with this information. But I do know that I want all of you to begin to understand the beauty and richness that is the Catholic faith. But more than anything, to understand the beauty of Jesus Christ. As I began to pack up my bags, final time to leave this monastery, I recognized that the experiences that I had experienced would be one that I would never forget. That these experiences and the people I met, whether they be monks or whether that they be guests, that these individuals would stay in my heart forever. And this experience would never leave my mind. Even at the time of this recording, many months after the finishing of this experiment, I recognize the answer. I recognize the answer to the meaning of the existence of life. The answer, my friend, to the question, what is the meaning of life, is Jesus Christ. We are made to know, to love, and to serve. But we are made to know, love, and serve a person, our creator, our maker, the person of Jesus Christ. Every time we take our minds, our eyes off of the person of Jesus Christ, we sink in the sand, we fall into the sea. But if you cast your gaze upon the person of Christ and seek him with your whole heart, you will not only have a fulfilled life in the context of man's interior soul, but you will also have the answer. You will have truth, because truth is a person.
and the person is Jesus Christ.